Hey everyone. In this video, I wanted to quickly look at Bing Chat. Everyone is talking about large language models and GPT. So I played around a little bit with Bing Chat just to explore some of what it is capable of. But it's maybe important to understand what it is. So we're used to the idea of Bing. So if we think of Bing, a search engine, there's really two phases to its functionality. There's a phase of it where it's crawling the web, i.e. it's searching through all the different web pages and the links they link to. And then based on what it finds, it creates an index. And then when we interact, what we perform is a search. We enter certain terms, which are then sent and queried against the index, and we get the various results. So that's a traditional search engine. And then we have these ideas of GPT v4 and these large language models. Now, very similar to this staged idea that there's this big, expensive upfront crawling and indexing. Now, obviously, with a search engine, it's an ongoing thing, but then we perform searches against it. When I think of a large language model, specifically, if we take GPT v4, well, initially, it has a huge amount of training done. Now, when we think about GPT v4, it is a generative pre-trained transformer, i.e. it's a large language model that's been pre-trained on large amounts of data. There's a huge data set that it was trained on. And it also has a self-attention mechanism. And what that really means is, if you think about, you give it a prompt, the information you send to it, it can work out the relationships between different parts of that prompt so it knows which bits are important to pay attention to when it's working out its various responses. So it understands which bit do I need to look at, which bits relate to other bits. Now, once we've done that training and it, it's got the trained model, what it then enables us to do is, well, it can perform inference against it. So there's the big upfront training, which is on that certain set of data that has a knowledge cutoff, it's trained on a certain amount of data. And then using the model, we send it the prompts. So we're using that model, and we get a response. And remember, what it's doing is predicting the next most probable token, most of the cases a word, and then the next most probable and the next, the next and so on. So we get a complete output of whatever that may be. So these are the two things. And what we're really doing when you think of Bing Chat, well, Bing Chat is bringing those two things together. It is not just, hey, it's a copy of the GPT v4 large language model. It's actually a lot more than that. So if we think of now we have Bing Chat. They developed their own technology to bring these things to give us a really useful assistant type system. Because remember, this large language model has a knowledge cutoff, which, hey, if I'm trying to do work, I'm trying to get information, well, I want to be able to combine it with up-to-dateness. Well, how does it do that? So the whole point is, when we type in our prompt, and we talk about this, we don't want to take my raw prompt. And I want to be able to mix different pieces of information together. So when we talk about Bing Chat, what we actually have powering all of this is there is this idea of a Bing orchestrator. And this concept of an orchestrator is also very common when we talk about the co-pilots in things like Microsoft 365. It enables the technology to take what we give it, because if we think about for a second what's actually happening here, let's draw us as the user. So here's us. In the case of Bing, maybe we're on a certain web page, whatever there may be. So there could be some context to what we're currently doing. But essentially what we do is we type in some prompt, our query, our request for help, and we're going to send it to that. Now, what it doesn't want to do is just send it to the large language model and get a response back. It's doing something called grounding. And what the grounding enables it to do, it's an iterative set of steps. And you'll even see it doing this when you type in a query, because what it's actually going to do is this chat 
will talk to and run inferencing queries against the large language model, but it will tell it, it will say, hey, and what's available to you is the ability to search, for example. So it can send back other information it wants. It can even communicate with this. Likewise, the orchestrator can go and do searches of different information and add it to the prompt that is then sent to the large language model. So all of this is grounding. So it doesn't just take what you say and pass it to the large language model, it enriches it, it adds its own sets of controls about, hey, you're gonna be well behaved, you're gonna be respectful. It can add in information that it thinks is good from a search term and adds it to it. When it sends it to the large language model, it gives it instructions on, hey, these capabilities and tools are available to you. So that large language model can go and say, hey, actually, I need some more information on, hmm. So we can go and do the search add the responses to another prompt. So all of this happens in the background. We don't see this, but that's why when we use Bing Chat, it's not limited to the knowledge cutoff that was used for the training, which was probably a couple of years ago now. It can have current information. So this is what's happening. And then ultimately when it goes through all of this grounding at the end of it, then finally we get some response back. So my key point of all of this is, okay, we wanna use this Bing chat. You don't have to overthink it. There's a whole set of guidance around prompt engineering and how you structure things. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but for most of us, we just don't need to do that. As long as we are very clear in our communication, this grounding is designed around the fact that, hey, it's just an average person interacting how do we give it some useful information back? But that is a key point. It doesn't know really anything about you or your capabilities. The best way to think about it is I'm communicating with something that's been trained on a huge amount of data, can talk in a huge number of different styles, but it doesn't know what's useful to me. It only knows what I type in at the prompt and if I give it permission, the context maybe of the page I'm on. So just be very clear and concise in what I want it to do. And again, it, it can respond in different styles. And also remember, there's a flow to this. When I type in a prompt and I get a response back, when I stay in the same topic, the same session, I can then make and ask questions about what has come before, ask it to clarify something, ask it for more information. And if I want to start a new topic completely, it's really important I start a new topic. Otherwise, what has come before is still being used as part of the prompt, because it's gonna get sent the old prompts as part of this, and it may confuse it. The longer the prompt goes on, it's gonna to start to maybe get muddled up. So if I'm starting a completely new query, I wanna make sure I start a new topic. So for example, if I'm over here, so I'm on Bing. Now it kind of puts it front and center anyway, but if I scroll up, we'll see in the top corner, we have chat. So if I select chat, I'm now in this, the Bing chat area. Now you'll notice it does give me different conversation styles. So it can be more creative, it's a, a balance between them, or it can be very precise. If I'm maybe doing something more on a development side, or I want it to summarize text I'm gonna paste in, I probably want it more precise. But a key point here is this little new topic brush. I want to do that. If I'm starting a new conversation, don't just, hey, I'm in the middle of something else and just start typing a new question start a new topic. It will refresh all the tokens, it will refresh the prompt, and it's gonna give you a better overall experience. So it's really important to use that new topic when I want to start a new topic. Now, when you do prompt engineering, there are a whole set of very complicated steps and things you may wanna do. If you are maybe doing something a bit more advanced and say, hey, summarize this article for me, or show me five key points about something, there's different things and structures you can use, but at a very high level, you can think of it as a UR, 
a so you're telling it, hey, you're a marketing assistant or you're a tax assistant or you're a Linux terminal or you're a SQL, um, you're a creative, whatever you want it to do. So I can think of a you are or act as, you see both of those used. So what is it acting as? You will. So what you want it to do. And then I can think of how you want it to output. So at a very basic level, I can think about my prompts. If it's a bit more advanced, I'd at least want to try and do those things. So you're acting as a certain role. Remember, it knows nothing about you. So if you're get, trying to get it to explain something to it, well, you are a sixth grade teacher, or you are a kindergarten teacher, or you are a university professor, um, you will create an outline. You're going to create a summary. You're going to create um, a, a list of possible headings for this. You're going to create five ideas for this topic. You will create a summary of text I'm going to paste below. And then I can think about, and you're going to output it as a table, as bullet points, as HTML, as a code block, whatever you can think of. And it is an interaction. So I can ask it to do something, it does that thing, and then I can ask it to do something else based on that flow while I'm in the same topic. So if we were to jump over for a second. So let's say, um, I'm gonna make it more precise, and maybe it's um, create a basic JavaScript hangman game. Provide only a code block with no explanations. So I'm giving it a fairly specific set of instructions here. And it's spitting that out. So that's my first, notice it is the first of 30. So it limits the number of interactions you have. There's also a limit on the number of topics I can do a day. So it's going through and it, it's following those instructions. And I could ask it to do it in Python or other things. It would give me some ideas. But now I could say, oh, can you explain what, uh, maybe you don't understand, what wrong guesses is doing. So I've taken the code and I am not understanding this certain thing. So I can ask it based on the context of what I have. Hey, here we go. Here's some ideas around that and it can expand and explain things. And you could carry on that interaction. That's really the, the whole point of what I can do here. Now for a second, I'm just gonna jump over to a completely new page. This is an article that Microsoft actually released about this new Bing. And it talks about the engine, the Prometheus engine on, on what powers this. But you'll notice in the recent Edge browser, you have the little Bing chat icon. Now that is controlled through the sidebar. So if I go into settings, and then in the settings, go into sidebar. Now I have the sidebar turned off, but then down here we have Bing chat. So in here you can control if that little Bing chat icon shows up. So I have that discover turned on, which means I have the little speech bubble. But a useful setting in here is this page context. So if I have this turned on, what it will allow me to do is that if I'm using the browser, I'm looking at a page, if I type the little Bing chat icon, it's allowed to understand the current context of the page I am in. So for example, if I'm looking at this page and I bring up the Bing chat, I could say, um, please summarize this page. And it's allowed to interact with the current text on my page, and hey, it's summarizing it for me. And then once again, I could go and ask more questions about it. It is allowed to do that. It's even suggesting some possible other questions. It also has Compose, so it brings to the forefront, hey, write about some question in different tones. So it can be funny, it can be informal, it can be formal, and it's got the format. So those things I wrote out about ways you can interact, this Compose 
bring some of those to the forefront for certain types of interactions I may want to do. And then insights is just going to give me some different information potentially about what I'm currently doing, what page I'm looking at in my experience. So this little Bing discover up here is an easy way to quickly interact with whatever content I may have. So that can be a really useful thing. Now, if you're not sure, there's a nice little GitHub page, and I've got the description in the links below, but it just has example prompts. And it talks about how I can use these, so act as a Linux terminal, act as an English translator and improver, act as a position interviewer, JavaScript, Excel. So if you wanna play around, there's just a huge number, act as a motivational speaker. It says all these different things. I mean, we could quickly try one, we could go with the first one, act as a Linux terminal. So if I was wanting to practice my Linux, but I didn't have a Linux terminal, remember we'd start a new topic, uh, more precise, and I'm just gonna enter that. So it's telling it, I want you to act as a Linux terminal, I'm telling it what I'm gonna do, and it's only supposed to respond. Okay, so home user, so I might say, okay, ps-a, and then it should carry on. Okay, what's the next most likely tokens acting as a Linux terminal? And sure enough, it's doing that. So if you're stuck for some ideas, I really like this. It's just a fun little page. So if I'm trying to do something a bit more advanced than just, hey, give me some ideas on X, this is a, a nice set of prompts. And it's just completely free. It's just a GitHub page that has all of these things available to you. So uh, it's a nice place to go and look. And the key point, again, is you don't need to overthink it. I am not interacting directly with the large language model. We have this grounding going on to improve the prompts we type. But do remember, be careful of what IP intellectual property you put into a prompt. If it's some intellectual property for your company, some personal emails, I would be careful with that. I wouldn't just put anything in here. What Any large language model, any public site, make sure you understand how that data can be used. And when it gives you the responses, you always need to validate it. Don't just take what it gives you. Remember, it's predicting the next most probable tokens. Now, Bing is interacting with search, so it's searching for things, but there's this concept of hallucinations. It can make things up because it's predicting, hey, what should come next? So always validate what it responds with just to make sure, don't just blindly take it and put it in a response or something else. But this grounding does give you very high quality results, but I still want to validate the output. So you don't have to overthink it. Um, be careful with what you send as part of the prompt and make sure you validate its output. But go and have a play. It's very easy to interact with. And uh, until next video, take care.